Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage ACYPL alumnus, Mr. Hodding Carter III. When I got here earlier, I looked out at the group and I said, my God, there's nothing that I can share because 50 years ago is for some of you before your parents were born. Then I realized that if you were going to have to watch a lot of people talking about themselves in film, as I just watched Spencer talk for the last half hour, that you would have some sense of the past about which I wanted to refer. Those who started this organization were many sorts and conditions, not all of whom knew a damn thing about the world. Having listened to sen two senators talking with great eloquence about the meaning of this place, you have to understand that if uh, a boy from Illinois and a boy from Kentucky felt cut off from the world in which we were operating, a boy from Mississippi was absolutely ignorant. And it was a great thing to discover that I was going to be working with people equally ignorant. And this is what you've got to know about stitching together the American Council of Young Political Leaders. This was not something which was a pattern which had been cut, as was often said by our enemies and friends, either by the agency across the river or by this or by that. It was something put together by people who honestly believed that young political leaders in the world in which we lived needed to know about the world in which we lived. Not from textbooks, which God knows many of us had studied, but from experience. And so it came together. And I'm not going to say much more about that because you've already been listening to people talking about it, but let me tell you that young political leaders meant what it said. This was not a benign group of nonpartisan do-gooders. These were partisan Democrats and Republicans coming together for the national interest, and we thought we were coming together for the national interest. We fought like dogs. And because most of you don't know Spencer Oliver, you don't know what a dog he can be in a fight. And he did it with his usual happy warrior approach. And yet, at the end of all of that, what we had were a bunch of people who, snarling and fighting and spewing, and put together some of the damnedest, not only trips, but connections. It was unbelievable that this group of young political leaders ultimately had connections which were meaningful to the Soviet Union, to China, to Australia, to Africa, and on and on. Remember, we began to be a connection to the Atlantic Alliance. That is who we were supposed to be doing. We were going to save young people like you from falling into the trap of misunderstanding the nature of the world and the enemy. So 50 years later, I find it amazing that some of us are still alive. I find it amazing that despite all of our efforts at extraordinary extraordinary combat among ourselves that we never let that thing get that one step too far. I would only suggest to you that watching a man as partisan as Spencer is, as intensely interested in winning, nonetheless help shepherd, guide, create, sustain, and remain committed to an organization like this is a reminder that really good things can come out of the American political process. Don't you ever forget it. The political process, not, not, do, not do good, not do good, oh, we're just going to rise above politics. No, we're going to use the political process to create ultimately a consensus about what we ought to be about and policy. So it is very hard for me, who knows Spencer as well as I do, and many of you do equally well, to say as many things as I want to say good about him. But I also know that too many of you don't understand any of the jokes I would tell. 
I'm going to pass it all by and said it's been a great privilege for me to work with Spence for these 50 years. It's been a great privilege for me to know him and because of him to get to know people as wide ranging in their views and their politics and their personalities as Pat Buchanan and any one of some guys sitting right here in front of me uh, closer in some ways to my politics than Pat's. But out of that came an organization which is one all of you can be proud of and God knows I'm proud of, but most important of all, I am proud of knowing and having worked with Spencer Oliver. Come on out, Spence. Uh, almost everything's been said uh, about the ACYPL and about the people who participated in it. It's certainly been, of course, a, a major part of my life. And it had an impact on the lives of a lot of people sitting in this room tonight. I didn't write a speech, but I wrote a bunch of cards that they told me, you, if you have a senior moment, you can refer to your cards. But most of what I was going to say has already been said, either on the video or by some of the people who were here. But the ACYPL turned out to be almost exactly what I hoped it would be when I took a Ford Foundation grant in 1970 to spend a year of my life trying to get it off the ground. And that was a place where young American politicians, on their way up, could get an experience in another world, abroad, another universe, add another dimension to their qualifications for higher office. And as we've seen tonight, Senator McConnell, Senator Durbin, former Senator Fowler, Governor Glenn Denning, Governor List, we've had people who have come through this system at an early stage of their political careers, having an appreciation for what was beyond our borders and also having an appreciation for bipartisan cooperation. The ACYPL is a model of bipartisan cooperation. Peter McPherson and I were the co-chairman of the Delegate Selection Committee for about seven years, I think, when a lot of the people who were in this room went on young political leader trips. We always made sure there was an exact number of Republicans, an exact number of Democrats, and we always negotiated a little bit about what we were going to do and where we were going to go. And we also talked about, we had quotas in those days. You know, we, we started, we were there, some of the original quotas of women, elected officials, minorities. And McPherson and I used to argue all the time about who was going to be responsible for filling those quotas. But eventually, it turned out pretty well. And you can look at the people who have come through this program, not only Senator Durbin and Senator McConnell, Senator Fowler, but Steny Hoyer, my old and dear friend who's here tonight, and many others in the Congress, and Kevin McCarthy and Roy Blunt and Jim Clyburn, and you can go on down the line. But in the leadership of the Congress, there are many people who at the early stage of their careers actually had the opportunity to go somewhere beyond their imagination, beyond their borders, beyond their constituencies, and learn a little bit about foreign policy, about what the world was all about, and about why it was so important for Americans to have some grounding in foreign affairs and foreign policy. So the ACYPL has done that job, and I'm really delighted that we were able to do it. I am particularly proud of the exchange with the Soviet Union. It started at a time when the Cold War was at its height. I had taken this Ford Foundation grant to try to set up the ACYPL, and the only, the only thing that we were affiliated with was the NATO Young Political Leaders, which every couple of years we would send delegations. Well, in the Democratic Party in the, in the late 60s, of course, there, were, there had been a scandal about the CIA controlling the National Student Association. You had the war in Vietnam, and they thought, that when I tried to persuade some of my 
colleagues on the left that they should participate in this program, that it was some kind of a CIA front and that it was, and they didn't want any part of it or, you know, NATO war, this and that. So we needed to find a way to get around that. So one evening, I went to a reception at Georgetown Club with my father. Uh, I think it was a fundraiser for John Dingle. And in, the, in this reception, someone came over and, and, and introduced me to a Soviet diplomat. I'll never forget him. His name was uh, Valerian Nisturov. And he said, what do you do? And I told him I was the executive director of the American Council of Young Political Leaders. And he said, well, what is that? And a light went off in my head. And I said, well, it's a program where all of the young political leaders in the United States are going to get to know all the other young political leaders around the world. And in effect, I could see him looking at this thinking, this is a conspiracy against us. So he said, well, why don't you do that with the Soviet Union? I said, oh, you guys would never do that. You'd never let us in. You'd never send, you know, you'd never let us take people to see the real United States and, you know, just be hopeless. Well, I'm not so sure about that, he said. I'd like to talk to you about it. Because he saw that suddenly we were going to compete with the whole common turn to try to bring all of the young political leaders around the world into our orbit and out of theirs. So I went to the State Department the next day and said, what if we did an exchange with the Soviet Union? And they said, oh, Spencer, they'll never do it. They said, we have this exchange agreement, cultural exchange agreement, and every year we negotiate what we're going to do over the next two years. And we propose certain things, and they, they take it into consideration. They come back six months later and say, yet. And they propose things, and we reject them almost right away. And I said, well, what if we wanted to do something with young political leaders? Never, never agree to it, I said. I said, well, how does it work? And they said, well, you know, we, we propose things, they propose things, and, and uh, they wait around and, and, you know, a few little things like basketball players or ballet dancers or operas or something, we get some agreement. I said, well, what if we did the young political leaders? It never happened. The next day, I got a call from this Soviet diplomat who said, I'd like to come and talk to you came to talk to me and said, I think that we could do this with the Soviet Union, with young political leaders, with the Komsomol. And I said, well, I don't see how you could do that because you guys, you know, just aren't going to do this in a way that would be acceptable to us. And besides, I understand that you all, you know, every time we propose something in the cultural exchange agreement, you reject it. Well, not necessarily. He said, if your side proposes it, I think I could influence our side maybe to, to accept it. So I tried to get the State Department to agree to that, and they didn't. So the Soviet guy came back and said, well, what if we propose it? I said, well, that would be really unusual. It would be a great idea. So I went to the State Department and said, what if they propose it? Well, we'll accept it. They'll never propose it. I said, I want your guarantee that you'll agree to it if they propose it. Soviet diplomat came back and said, I think we're, I think we're willing to propose it. I have instructions from Moscow that we can, we can make a proposal. And I said, great. And he said, well, what should it say? <laughs> so I wrote the proposal. <laughs> they, they sent it to the the State Department and they accepted immediately. So not many months later, we were in Moscow and some of the people sitting at this table here, Lyndon Blue and Bob List and White Fowler and Don Fowler, Stu Ross, we were in Moscow in the darkest times of the Cold War. And Dick Durbin told you earlier about how they wore you out with vodka and so on and so forth. We also did the Red Square and, and Novosibirsk and Siberia and snow and and you name it. But we learned a lot, and it shaped, I think, our lives forever when it came to foreign policy and foreign affairs. And it began an exchange which I think was extraordinarily valuable in the long run. We did the NATO things. We started a program with China. We started a program with Japan. We started a program with Australia. Now the ACYPL has branched out to Africa. Asia and Latin America and all over, but nothing was quite as seminal and important as that first Soviet delegation. 
And Pat Buchanan, I got Pat to go with me on that trip because I thought that I'd get a lot of criticism from the right for going and having an exchange with the communist. And uh, so Pat agreed to go. He was in the Nixon White House at the time. And we had some wonderful moments in that, uh, in that delegation. Some of the people at this table in front of me will remember that, where we were at a university in Novosibirsk, and the delegation was going down the hall toward the auditorium, and Pat and I were shuffled off to the side onto a stage, and there were two seats on one side. On the other side, there were two young Komsomol leaders sitting, and the rector of the university was standing there, and we said, I think we're in a debate. <laughs> whole student body was there, and they let them go first. And they ripped us apart about, you know, all the usual things about, you know, poverty and racism and, and pornography and all these things. Pat was sitting next to me and said, you got to let me at him. you got to let me go first. <laughs> and boy, he did. And those who are sitting here at this table will remember that day, and I'll tell you, the Hobo Chingpek, as it looked like when you spelled it in Russian, it looked like Hobo Chingpek. They lost that debate, and, uh, and it was, it was a, a moment which uh, none of us will ever forget. And of course, when people went home from these trips, Russian trip especially, they became, in a way, sort of celebrities. They wrote articles in the local newspaper, they were interviewed, they spoke to the Rotary Club, they became instant foreign policy experts. So for years after, in some of these small towns, if something went on in the world, the local paper would call them up and say, what do you think about the nuclear test ban treaty or whatever? Because you're supposed to be an expert on foreign policy. So, and of course, a lot of politicians were quick to agree that they were experts and were happy to be interviewed. But it, was, uh, it worked out extraordinarily well. I think about the third trip, because the Soviets wrote terrible things in their newspapers about these exchanges and about how weak the Americans were and so on. And our guys went home, guys and gals, it wasn't just all guys, and wrote articles and were interviewed about how terrible the Soviet system was. And, you know, so these, these embassies were reporting back and forth about what they were saying with each other. And about the third trip, I think, I not remember exactly when it was, but I had to leave early to do something. And I went to Moscow, and my counterpart was a man named Gennady Yanayev, who was at one point vice president of the Soviet Union and uh, vice president of Russia and acting president for about three days. Uh, but he, we had a dinner, and he said, I want, I want there to be, he said, your people are saying terrible things about us in the American press and the American newspapers. And I want there to be an agreement between you and I that no matter what happens, no matter what anybody says, no matter how terrible the press is, you and I will agree that this exchange will not cease, that it will continue to go on no matter what. I said, agreed with that, because for him, it was the best patronage that they had. Can you imagine a young Komsomol leader in Siberia in the Cold War who suddenly was able to go to the United States for two or three weeks and see, see the United States, the great forbidden land, and all expenses paid and have a, a great time. They could shop in New York and so on. They did not want to give up that patronage. And we didn't want to give up our opportunity to try to educate young Americans about how bad that system really was and about what it was all, what it was, uh, what it was all about. And when they came to the United States, Governor List is sitting here at the table, and he was on the first delegation. And we had a, we always negotiated where people were gonna go on the next trip. I was in Moscow and they, we were negotiating about where the next Soviet delegation would go. And they said to me, leader said, Vladimir Prokopov, who some of these people will remember, he said, look, we're gonna negotiate on this, and we wanna go to Las Vegas but we can't ask to go to Las Vegas. And you have to take us to Las Vegas. And when you propose it, we're gonna reject it and deny it and threaten the, the break off of the whole program if you put Las Vegas on there. But no matter what we do, you take us to Las Vegas. 
And when we flew into Las Vegas, there was Bob List, who was then the Attorney General, standing there with a brass band welcoming these guys. And we went through the airport, and he had a whole set of limousines out front, a limousine for each member of the delegation. And there was a, 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 a V-shaped motorcycle escort, which took us straight into Las Vegas just as the sun was setting and the lights were coming on. We pulled up in front of the sands, and there was a bellhop there with a sign in Russian with the name of each delegate. And they, they went, each one had a suite of their own. And you can imagine what the suites were like in Las Vegas in those days. So that night, we went to uh, one of those big, you know, uh, Broadway show type things with dancers and so on. And then we went to a midnight show. Then we went to a midnight show of Sammy Davis Jr. And I think they, they I, I know I'm talking too long, but I want to finish this story. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> it was Sammy Davis Jr. at the sand. And unbeknownst to us, it was his birthday. So the Rat Pack all came and surprised him. And his father came, and they tap danced together, and Sinatra sang, and you had Joey Bishop and Peter Lawford and all of these people, Dean Martin. And it went on till 3 o'clock in the morning. It was an unbelievable night. They, they were sure that we set this up just for them. Of course, it was just accidental. But when we went back to the lobby of the hotel and it was time to go to bed, they asked to have a moment alone. So he went off and they had a little huddle on the side. And the leader came back and he said, he said, look, we're not going to bed. <laughs> I said, but you've got to have breakfast with the mayor in the morning. And they said, we will promise that we will all be on time for the breakfast for the mayor, but we are not going to bed. <laughs> And they spent, they had a great time in Las Vegas. And as Bob, Bob, of course, Bob set a standard that nobody could ever match or ever should. <laughs> but those were the kinds of things that we did for them to show them our country. They stayed in private homes in Davenport, Iowa, and, and Mississippi, and Greenville, Mississippi, where Hotting was. And it made a huge difference in the way they thought and what they did. And when the Soviet Union imploded in, the, in 1989, 1990, there were six members of the Politburo who had participated in the young political program in the 70s. So they had had a, a, an indoctrination and, and uh, an insight into America that no leaders of the Soviet Union had ever had before. And after the Soviet Union split up into 15, 15 republics became 15 separate countries. Many of these people who had been in that program became presidents and prime ministers and speaker of the house. They were in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Moldova. I went to these places in those days and the people who were in charge were people who were former Soviet young political leaders who were now patriots of Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Moldova, Georgia, wherever. And it made a huge difference. Many of these countries are now in NATO. Others are, will soon be in NATO. So I think we had an impact. It was a, it was a two-way street. I never expected it would be a two-way street. I was trying to get Americans out and just see the world. And then we found, of course, that the reciprocal uh, programming group of people who had gone to these places was probably the best programming uh, organization in the United States for people who were in politics who, because all these people could open every door and see all these things. So it was, it's been a marvelous ride for me. I have uh, spent the last 23 years in Europe as Secretary General of an OSCE organization and in 56 countries. 56 parliaments, throughout all of these places, almost everywhere I've gone, I have seen people and met people who participated in this program or who knew about it or were influenced by it. And just to close, last year, I was in Moscow. We went there every year for a 
bilateral with the president of the parliamentary assembly and me, I was the secretary general. We would always meet with the, with the speaker of the parliament and the foreign minister and the head of the Federation Council. Well, last year, the head of the Federation Council was a woman named Valentina Matvienko. And I remembered her from a young political leader trip. And we sat down in the usual across the table from each other, and she said, have we met before? I said, yes. She said, I thought so. Then we went on with a meeting with the usual stuff, talking about Ukraine and so on. And as we were leaving, she said, where did, shaking hands at the door, she said, where did we meet? I said, we met when you came to the United States in 1976, and I took you around the country with your delegation. She said, oh, I remember that. That was so wonderful. Thank you so much. And then as we, we left, we walked down a long hallway toward the elevator, and this woman, she is the second most powerful woman person in, this, in Russia. She is number two to Putin. In if he died, she'd be president. She came bounding down the hall grabbed me and said, that trip changed my life. I'll never forget it. So, so, so for me, that made a lot of this worthwhile. So I want to thank all of my friends, my colleagues, my Republican colleagues who made this happen, Peter McPherson, Randy Teague, Judy Black, and others. We made it bipartisan all the way, and we made it work. Might be a good idea to remember that these days. But it was something that uh, affected my life, changed the path of which direction I was going to go, and gave me great satisfaction to participate in the life of this country abroad and, and in international affairs. And most importantly, I made a lot of friends. And a lot of you made a lot of friends with each other, Republicans and Democrats across the aisle, traveling with each other and meeting each other. So it was a very wonderful experience. And I want to thank you for it. I want to thank Linda Rotano and her great staff for putting this thing together. They worked very hard. I gave them a hard time a few times, but basically uh, they put it together. And, and I think it's a wonderful event. It's a great way to celebrate 50 years of a, of a good and useful program who has done a great deal for all of us. So thank you very much. Spencer, I can honestly say it's because of you. I have some very good Republican friends. <laughs> On behalf of the ACYPL Board of Trustees and staff, it is my pleasure to recognize the enormous contributions you've made to this organization for your brilliant idea, for your belief that bipartisanship should always be at the center of what we do, for your relentlessness in convincing the Ford Foundation and Hank Greenberg and Congressman Fussell and the State Department that ACYPL was worth investing in. For setting the tone by establishing exchanges with not just our friends, but more importantly, our adversaries. For your years of leadership and stewardship of ACYPL and for allowing us to drag you back into our world after 30 years. Thank you. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage ACYPL alumnus and American Council of Young Political Leaders Chairman of the Board of Trustees, Rick Smotkin. All right. Well, that's going to be quite the act to follow, so I am going to be very quick. But um, I just really want to thank everyone for being here tonight to celebrate such a special occasion and something that means so much to so many of us. And I, want, I won't make everyone sing happy birthday, but I would like to propose a toast. So I want to bring a shot of tequila up here, but I went with the beer to be a little more appropriate. But if everyone could raise their glasses to Spencer and to all the ACYPL trailblazers for turning such a brilliant idea into a lasting legacy, to leaders McConnell and Durbin for their outstanding leadership and their continued commitment to this mission, to the State Department for 50 years of partnership, to our corporate and foundation partners for your continued generous investment. Without it, this would not be possible. Um, to all of the amazing alumni in this room, around the country and around the globe for everything you have done, to my fellow board members and a special thanks to Brian. I think Brian Diffel is sitting somewhere over there. Please wave, Brian. Your efforts the last six months have been tireless. You've done yeoman's work to keep us focused, to hit our targets, so thank you so much for that. And to 50 years of just amazing, often surprising, friendships and partnerships across the political spectrum and around the world. And here I'm gonna go off script for just a minute. And I think those words, the surprising friendships sum up what I'm gonna, who I'm gonna give a special thanks to now. I was fortunate enough on my first trip to have Linda Rotuno, who Spencer so graciously talked about, um, as my escort. And if any of you know, for those who know me and Linda, you'll understand that we probably have nothing in common, <laughs> especially when it comes to politics. Uh, we couldn't be more different. But from the moment we started that trip, um, we have formed a truly lasting friendship and bond. And that's what makes this organization so critical, so important. And with that, I know Linda's probably going to kill me. As you've noticed tonight, I mean, she's the only CEO of an organization who would not have some opportunity to speak, but that's how she works. She's tireless in her efforts and her dedication and commitment to this organization. So with that, I want to do a special toast to Linda for all that she has done and will continue to do for this organization. And I know if I ask her to come out here, she won't, so I won't force her to come out here, but please everyone know how much she does for this organization. So thank you, Linda. And with that, one last toast to 50 more years of this great organization. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy dessert and conversation. <laughs>